everyone, to all the people who are worshiping with us online, and to all the people who are with us here in church. I hope that we are all wide awake and we have prepared ourselves to worship our God today. And may we keep anything that can distract us for today's service and keep our phones in silent mode. Let us begin with this verse found in Psalms 138 verses 1 to 5. Let us read all together. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing you your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. May I invite, may I ask everybody to stand up? And let me greet you all a blessed Sunday. Welcome to UECG Metro East English Worship Service. We're glad that you can join us today, whether you're here face to face or via online. As we all know that next Monday, I think it's next Monday, May 9, will be Election Day. We can see that whether on the news, social media, and even in church, we are talking about politics. Campaigns, ads, and even rally or gatherings of politicians who want to run for a certain position in the government are everywhere. These things are dividing us. But you know what's more sad about what's happening right now? People are idolizing these politicians. They're putting their trust, hope, and faith to these people, believing that they are the only one who can lead us and give us a better life. You know what? Someone already did that 4,000 years ago. And his name is Jesus. But during that time, nobody is cheering him, shouting or singing campaign jingle to him and not even believing him that he alone can save and change the world. Let me share to you a passage it's found in Psalm chapter 62, verses 5 to 8. And it says there, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. O God, rest my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Let us set aside things that hinder us from worshiping our God right now and let us focus in giving honor and praise to Jesus Christ. Let us all declare that our faith will never be shaken for He alone is our only hope, our strength, our Savior, our one true King and our Lord. I will declare my choice to the nations. I will shout for joy to the congregation. I will worship God. Worship God. All my days, those who love the Lord are satisfied. Those who trust in Him are justified. I will serve my God. Sing this one more time. I will declare my choice to the nation. Sing. I will declare my choice to the nation. Yeah, I will shout for joy. Congregation, I will worship God all my days. Those who love the Lord are satisfied, those who trust in Him are justified. I will serve my God. The word of 
of the Lord will stand. Church, let's sing this. His love will endure. Oh, the joy of the Lord is strength to my soul. Sing this. I will not be shaken. I will not be moved. I will not be shaken. Let this be our declaration. I will declare I will declare my choice to the nation yes I will shout for joy for the congregation I will worship God all my days those who love the Lord are satisfied those who trust in him Justified, I will serve my God. Serve my God. All my day. Come on, church, let's sing this. The nations crumble. The word of the Lord will stand. Faith rise and fall. His love will endure. joy is the Lord my strength to my soul I will not be shaken I will not be moved I will not be shaken let's sing this from our hearts when the nations crumble when the nations crumble, the word of the law will stand, will rise and fall, his love will endure. The strong may stumble, for oh, the joy of the Lord is twisting to my soul. I will not be shaken. I will not be shaken. I will not be moved. I will not be moved. I will not be shaken. I will not be shaken. I will not be moved. I will not be shaken. I will not be shaken. I will not be moved. I will not be shaken. Lord, we will not be shaken. I will not be shaken. of 
messengers of your word may we seek the lost and the weak and may we have the heart for those who are in need may you touch our hearts and instill in our minds to have a servant's heart to only you we abide Divided, but 
one you move and reign a heart of beats compassion pleases you my lord a sweet aroma of worship the rises to your throne a heart that hides your word a heart that hides your word so that sin will not come in a heart that's undivided but one you move it with oh, a heart that beats compassion that pleases you my lord a sweet aroma of worship that rises A heart that hides your word. A heart that hides your word, so that sin will not come in. A heart that's undivided, but one you rule and reign. A heart that beats compassion, that pleases you, my Lord. A sweet aroma. My worship that rises to your throne, sweet aroma, a sweet aroma of worship that rises to your throne, sweet aroma, a sweet aroma of worship. The rises to your throne. Would you bow down and come to the Lord in prayer? Yes, Father, that's the desire for hearts, Lord. That we may have a pure heart a heart that you rule and you reign a heart father god that will bring sweet aroma of worship for this church father god we want you to be enthroned and the one who is really focused on that we are focused on you for that is what our heart of worship wants to do father lord we bow before your most holy presence and we look up to you our sovereign almighty god who is our great provider who is our protector and our source of power at all times in every situation father let your word be our rule and our guide your Holy Spirit, our Comforter, be our teacher to enlighten our minds that we may truly learn the lessons you want us to teach today. Father, enable us, Lord, through the empowering of your Holy Spirit that we may apply your word in our daily lives and activities. May your greater glory be our supreme concern. Father, we especially pray for those who are sick those who are afflicted by the COVID and those we have heard Lord may have been in the hospital right now or going through some physical concerns Lord would you pl please touch them with your healing grace Father we also pray for those emotionally affected would you be the wonderful counselor let them experience your peace that surpasses all understanding that will guard their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus. We pray for those who are financially difficult, who are having financial problems. Would you guide them and give them wisdom how to be able to stand up again and provide for them Lord to start with in a miraculous ways. Just as you have provided Father God in many situations, in the Bible Lord we thank you for how you would bless the worship today 
would you use mightily Father God our speaker Pastor Mike empower him Lord through the Holy Spirit that the words that he would speak Father would not only minister to us but we would really carry it with us and apply it Father thank you bless us Lord with your presence thank you for we pray this in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us continue by reading our scripture for this morning, which is found in Matthew 22, verses 15 to 22. Uh, let us open our Bibles and read together. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way God tr of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearance. Tell us, then, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. Our topic for this morning is about the Christian politics and the coming elections. We are privileged to have our guest speaker for today. He is Pastor Michael R. Carino, who is a writer, mentor, teacher, philosopher, theologian, pastor, missionary, and spiritually based in Manila. He finished Bachelor of Arts in Political Science at Far Eastern University, Master of Divinity and Biblical Studies at International Graduate School of Leadership and Masters of Arts and Philosophy at University of the Philippines. Pastor Mike is one of the pastor of at Christian Bible Church of the Philippines and an adjunct instructor at the International Graduate School of Leadership. He is married to Ethel and they have a son, Josiah Kairos. Again, uh, let us welcome Pastor Michael Carino. Good day, everyone. I'm so happy to be with you today as you worship the Lord and as we listen to His Word. Our message for today is close to our hearts because something is happening on May 9 in the Philippines, and that is we are about to choose our leaders. Many of us are afraid, probably anxious probably angry, or many of us have been hurt the past few months during the campaign and during the discussions on politics, even with fellow believers, with our family and friends, and even those outside the church. So today we'll be talking about what does God's word say to us when it comes to politics? Should we even talk about politics as believers, as Christians? I personally believe that God is calling us to be a light to the world, a witness for the gospel in every sphere of society, and that includes politics. So this morning, we will ask the Lord to speak to us, to give us wisdom, to guide us, and to enlighten us as well as we navigate through this difficult, hurtful, toxic environment called Philippine politics. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we ask you, Lord God, to speak to us in whatever situation we are in. I pray, Father, that your word will come alive and grip our hearts and change our lives like a compass giving us directions, like a lamp giving us guidance in whatever decision and choices we have to make. And I pray, Father, that your word will be like a surgery scalpel that will destroy and dismantle any arrogance, any pride, any sinfulness or selfishness that hinders us from honoring you with our lives, with our relationships, with our actions, and our thoughts, and our desires. 
Thank you, Lord, for this time as we listen to you. Speak to us, Father. We honor you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In politics, Christians align themselves with different views and different sides of major political issues. Some Christians will argue passionately about some government action or policies, but there will be also Christians on the other side who will argue loudly against it. Kaya bangayan, may awayan, at matindi yung ating pagkakaiba sa ating mga opinion in terms of politics. Moreover, there are times that we tend to be too emotionally invested to certain preferred political candidates to the point that we are willing to destroy or damage our relationships with our fellow believers because of disagreements in politics. That is very sad. That is why when it comes to politics, it can really become so emotionally toxic, mentally draining, relationally messy, and spiritually destructive. Marami ka na bang inan friends sa Facebook? Marami ka na bang binlock na friends or churchmates or relatives? Marami ka na bang inan friends sa social media? Have you had hateful exchange of views? Hurtful words, hateful words with a relative or a friend or a classmate or an office mate because of politics? Sa totoo lang, politics is not really dirty. It's the people who make it dirty. We need politics in our lives. We need politics in our society, in our governance. Or else, we will have a world of full of chaos. But the truth is, politics tend to polarize society in general. And the body of Christ in particular. Political divisions are evident on social media where discussions by all sides are usually angry, hateful, and personal. As a result, it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to carry out a reasoned exchange of divergent views even among Christians. Ang hirap mag-usap ng medyo kalmado at medyo rational, puro emotional kasi tayo, lalo na tayo mga Pilipino. Tayo yung mga pikon. Sadly, this hateful and harmful kind of political polarization is happening all over the world. It's getting worse actually. Some experts call it the rise of political sectarianism. Kung merong religious sectarianism na everyone is so fanatic about their beliefs, there's also a political sectarianism going on. It's a growing tendency of one political group to view their opponents as morally inferior. The level of political divisiveness on both sides creates this feedback loop of, loop of hate where one camp labels or marks the opposing, opposing camps or differing views as either idiots, immorals, evils, or heretics. Parang nawawala na human dignity sa ating mga usapan pagdating sa politika. I have so many friends. These are good, godly Christians, followers of Jesus. So in the normal conversations, we have coffee and we have fun and very, very harmonious and wholesome conversations. But when the conversations turn to politics, it's like everyone is demon-possessed. Parang bigla nag lumalabas yung mga pangil at umuusok ang mga teng at ilong. Sabi ko, what's happening? Napag-usapan lang, nasingit lang ang politika, parang we are all... Possess. We are no longer Christians in our conversations. We need to bring back that human dignity. You know, at the very, very least, that we see the other person, no matter how different opinions or views he has, the other person is created in the image of God, is a human being also confused and asking questions and having these difficult inquiries like us. And that we don't bash or cancel or that we don't damage or burn bridges. Hindi naman talaga ganun yung panawagan natin bilang mananampalataya. So the question today is how should Christians engage in political debates over divisive issues like politics? So today we'll be reflecting on an event when Jesus was dragged into a political controversy of his day. Nung panahon ni, ng Panginoong Yesus, meron din mga controversial political issues. And one of them, is taxation to a foreign conqueror. Whoa! So let me review the passage. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap, in, trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, 
they said, We know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You are not swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying tax. They brought him a denarius and he asked them, Whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed so that they left him and went away. So the religious leaders were trying to trap Jesus into the political controversies of their day. So knowing that either answer would very likely cause him trouble, Jesus, instead, uh, instead of making a dangerous statement, he, he was unwilling to take their bait. He was unwilling to take any sides. Jesus responded instead with a command and a question. He told them, show me the coin used to pay the tax. And then he asked them whose image it bore. When they answered that the coin bore the image and inscription of Caesar, he offered this enigmatic response. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give back to God what is God's. With this reply, Jesus refused to take a side in the fierce political debate of his day over poll tax and implied that loyalty to a pagan foreign government was not incompatible with loyalty to God. Ah! In other words, the truth about governments, empires, rulers is that they will all come and go. They will all rise and fall. Yet God remains in charge of our nation, of our world, this, therefore, our highest allegiance is to God and not to political entities or to governing authorities. There are at least four reflections we can gather from this event in Jesus' uh, involvement in a political question. This is the first reflection we can have today. We belong to a higher kingdom. God's rule is above and beyond any political government. Very interesting. Among Jesus' 12 disciples, he had two disciples who, have, who belong to different political camps. He included, Jesus included a government official who is loyal to the Roman government, Matthew, the tax collector. And on the other hand, he also had another disciple who is a revolutionary activist who wants to fight the Roman government, Simon the Zealot magkaiba ng politika pero parehong tagasunod ni Jesus. Well, Jesus did not condemn Matthew's apparent submission and service to the political leaders of their time. He also neither condemned Simon's anti-government political convictions. Ah! Pero pwede pala magkaiba ng political opinions and political perspectives and yet, at the end of the day, be both loyal, committed followers of Jesus Christ? Jesus seems to be showing us that the values, the principles, and the purposes of his kingdom are beyond and above the political kingdoms of this world. Matthew and Simon may have different political preferences, but at the end of the day, they were both followers of Jesus. That means, mga kapatid, we may disagree with other believers about their opinion about government, yet we all belong to Christ's family. So, don't destroy your brother in the Lord. Don't burn bridges or demonize your sister in the Lord simply because they will vote differently. We are citizens of a higher kingdom. That is why no matter who rules our world, no matter who leads the Philippines, tyrants, corrupt leaders, or empires, as God's people, we have the confidence. We don't need to panic or be in despair. Some of my friends fear that when this candidate wins on May 9, it will be the end of the world or end of the Philippines for that matter. Well, we have a 
We have a different set of reality that governs our lives. And that's why we do not fear. We do not panic. As God's people, we have confidence instead of panic, fear, anger, or despair that God's rulership is above and beyond all governments and political leaders of this world. That sounds comforting, right? And encouraging. We walk by faith, not by fear. So as Christians, we find comfort and peace knowing that whoever ends up in power is in that position because God has allowed that to happen. So whether you like or disapprove of whoever is in authority, the Almighty God is still on the throne and He has a plan and purpose for, for our nation or for our world that our finite minds cannot comprehend, not yet. We don't have all the answers. So whether whoever Julius Caesar or Nebuchadnezzar or Pontius Pilate rules the Philippines, we believe that there is a higher ruler, that there's a higher reality, a higher kingdom that we belong to. That's why the Apostle Paul says in Romans 13, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Well, this is a better pill to swallow, no? especially if you don't like the governing authorities that are above us, whether it's your boss in the office, or your principal at school, or your senior pastor, <laughs> I'm just kidding, or your mayor, or your president or prime minister in whatever nation. God says, I have a plan. And so there are many things that Jesus wanted us to, that God wanted us to do that are difficult. Love your enemies, turn the other cheek, take up your cross, bless those who persecute you. And one of the list of difficult things that God wants us to endure and do, to submit to authorities, whether you like them or not. The second reflection we can have today based on what, we, what Jesus did in that political controversy is this. We are spiritually united in Christ, yet our political views as believers are diverse. Christian disagreements about politics are often disputes on matters of, of mere opinion. This is found in Romans 14 as well. No? When Christians debate and dispute about matters of food and clothing and, and preference or, or music or politics. That is why political debates should not cause division among believers. We can love one another in Christ even when we do not agree in politics. Hence, Christians need to practice unity even when we disagree. As the saying goes, by Roberto Smeldenius in Essentials, Unity, in Non-Essentials, Liberty, in All Things, Charity. That means we need to generate more light than heat when it comes to divisive issues like this. Romans 14 says, Welcome with open arms fellow believers who don't see things the way you do. And don't jump all over them every time they do or say something you don't agree with. Because some believers, maybe probably they're just growing and they're not yet that mature in their opinions or perspectives. And that's okay. Don't jump all over them. Don't bash or condemn them. Even when it seems that they are strong on opinions but weak in the faith department. This is the Apostle Paul in Romans 14. And we have a plethora of things we can disagree with. Mode of baptism, the meaning of the Lord's Supper, when will, when will the rapture happen, and what how many years will the tribulation be? And, and what Bible version is more authentic? And so on and so forth. But it doesn't mean we need to disfellowship or destroy other believers simply because they did not agree with our opinions about certain matters. So instead of calling all followers of Christ to speak with one political voice or claiming to resolve political debates definitively with one single answer, we must recognize that there are different answers and there are, di there are different Christian views when it comes to politics. We must accept that the goal is not for conformity or unanimity. There is no Christian vote. 
But there is this Christian unity amidst our political diversity. For that matter, it does not serve democracy well when we vote for we, when we all vote for one candidate. That's not democracy. Democracy is more alive and more flourishing when we have different views and different opinions and we are allowed to voice them out and express them. That's why we do not vote for the same candidates. Hence, a healthy church would allow space for members to hold a range of political views, advocate for those views, and still feel loved in Christ. So we need to stop shaming, belittling, demeaning, dismissing, or demonizing fellow believers who do not agree with our opinions in politics. We Christians must learn how to do political dialogue and have honest conversations without getting, without getting angry. We do not have to agree on all matters of politics, but we need to stay one in Christ. Ephesians 4 says, Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with one another making allowance for uh, each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. I was having a meeting with some of my fellow pastors in church recently. In fact, it's yesterday. And we were trying to address these issues as well. And we are also having members who, church members who seem to uh, be not happy with the way church is addressing politics or making positions on the issues. And in, in, in the conversation, one statement came out. I think the higher value here is love more than, more than clarity. <laughs> Sometimes we don't have answers to all questions. Sometimes we have, don't have solutions to all issues. And sometimes we need to, to, to choose our battles and fight better fires and ignore lesser fires but at the end love is stronger than being right or than winning arguments or than proving our points when we show kindness and love to our fellow believers even when it's difficult to do so so it's crucial that the church be understood as a diverse family of believers with different political views that finds its commonness in Christ. The nature of how we engage politically and how we disagree with each other is an aspect. It shows about the quality of our discipleship as well. So working across boundaries of political opinions, we can seek unity in Christ as we share the gospel message to a broken world. That's a priority, you know? The unity of the believers at all cost, and the effectiveness of the gospel at all, at all cost. When the gospel is bridged to all people of political colors and political stripes, when we can establish relationships to all people regardless of who they vote for, for the sake of the gospel, we swallow our pride and our perspectives so that people are one. That's what the Apostle Paul did, no? common ground. I become all things to all men so that I may save some. Hence, it is problematic when a certain group baptizes their political view as the only Christian view. When we dismiss nuances and diversity in democratic discourse and dialogue and claim that we have absolute monopoly of the right view, tayo lang ang tama, lahat mali. Tayo lang ang kristyano, lahat mga compromiser. We end up with nothing but outrage, devoid of intellectual humility and integrity. So as Christians, we need to agree that the most significant aspect of our relationship, of our Christianity, is our relationship or our connectedness with Jesus Christ and with one another. It's not our political views. So when it comes to politics, all Christians disagree. The question is, does it matter how we disagree? The third reflection we can gather from this passage that we read today is this. We are the light of the world. Our thoughts, speech, and actions must reflect who Christ is. So in the New Testament, it speaks exhaustively about how we as believers are to conduct ourselves in all spheres of life, 
including politics. This is certain that we are, our citizenship in the kingdom of God is meant to inform and shape the way we exercise our citizenship in our own nation. So parang bilang mga Kristiyano, we represent the values of the kingdom in whatever spheres of society we are involved in. Business, education, medicine, teaching, di ba? Politics. This means that we are to be more engaged in the political process representing the values of the kingdom of God. It means a cultiv- cultivating a willin- willingness to bear our political responsibilities. We need to vote as Christians no matter what the cost. Christ instructs us that you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before men, before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So if political engagement, for example, is, is chiefly an act of neighborly love, what if political engagement and political dialogue and political voting is part of our loving our neighbor? The Apostle Paul defined love as kind. Love is kind in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Then, there is no excuse for us to take our political responsibilities without the kindness that Scripture requires. Don't get me wrong, being kind is that does not mean you are to be spineless or weak. In fact, on the contrary, a spirit-driven commitment to convictional kindness in the face of slander and misrepresentation takes courage and resolve. It take, it's harder to be kind than to be hateful, in fact. So, kindness takes a lot of courage, even when it hurts. And this attitude might just be the thing that will turn the tide of politics today. So when entering political conversation as Christians, we should be more focused on loving our neighbor and honoring the dignity of that person than proving a point or winning an argument. Grabe, no? Ibig sabihin, mas mahalaga sa Panginoon na meron tayong paggalang, pagmamahal at respeto sa dignidad ng ating katunggali sa debate more than winning the argument. Yes, we can win an argument and lose the person. We can prove our point and lose a friend and lose a soul. Perhaps how we engage as well, our tone and our approach is just as important as what the argument we bring in the conversation. Minsan matataas ang IQ natin in terms of how we defend our point and how we stress our argument but we have low EQ. So how we speak and engage in politics should be glorifying to God. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, I mean, slow to anger as well. Be caring, be loving, be respectful. Be Christ-like in our conversations. That means every person has worth and value whether you disagree with the person or not. And our conversations with them should reflect that. Nakakalungkot, ano? Sometimes we can be carried away and we can be too emotionally invested and we forget the image of God in the person or we forget that the person is also bought by the blood of Jesus and he's a brother and sister in Christ and we, we get carried away. Politics can do that to us. <laughs> we forget our humanity or we forget our Christianity. Thus, we need to focus on finding common ground with others. So, I think the message today is also a post-May 9 elections message. The day after elections. Diba? Meron yung cycle of grief. Eh. There will be denial. Denial, denial. There will be anger. There will be depression. Kaya, we're, we're thinking of a post-election event for our church. To heal relationships. To repent from sinful speech and sinful behavior during the campaign. And to rethink the theology of submitting to those who were established in authority, whether we like them or not, whether we voted for them or not. Tindin, I think your church should have that too. A post-elections debrief, a theological, spiritual debrief. 
and not joining the emotional cycles of anger after elections. We must also remember that there's more to people than their political affiliations. Diba? Sometimes when a person declares who, or who he or she will vote for, our immediate reaction, our knee-jerk reaction is to cancel the person, cancel his or her business, or cancel or his or her page, or his you know, showbiz uh, platform and whatnot. But there's more to people than their political preferences. We need to remember that. Before you bash your parents, before you bash your classmate, before you hate your churchmate, because they said they will vote for certain candidates that you do not like, there's more to them than their votes. <laughs> it's the image of God in them. The value that God sees in them. I dream that our churches will be a safe haven for all political colors, for all people of political colors, from the left to the right, from the red, the yellow, the green, the blue, and the white. The sinners, the broken, the wounded, the corrupt, the tyrant, the slaves and the masters all come to the cross because we are bridge builders and peacemakers and ministers of reconciliation. We're not called to bash or to cancel or to burn bridges. So you think before you post in social media, you think before you comment in that thread, Check your heart. What's your motive behind that post? Are you trying to change people's minds? Do you want others to think of you in a certain way? Are you trying to belittle or discredit people who don't believe what you do? Or do you enjoy inciting arguments to make people get engaged in verbal wars of comments? Colossians 4 says, Let your conversations be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. As Christians, we must use social media as a tool to build others instead of contributing to the negativity. Our behavior on social media is part of our witness as Christians. The last reflection we can have today based on what we read is we trust that God is in charge of history. So therefore, we need to pray with discernment and vote with wisdom. Ultimately, God is the sovereign king who rules our planet. No political candidate will ever hold a government position apart from God's plan and God's will. Remember Daniel who served under King Nebuchadnezzar? He served under a ruthless political leader. By the way, that during the time of Daniel, Babylon is the most demonic empire ever. And Nebuchadnezzar is the most politically corrupt tyrant who ever lived. So don't name your dogs Nebuchadnezzar. It's an ugly, demonic name. You know what Daniel says? Praise be to the name of the God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are His. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with Him. In other words, God is in charge. What does a Daniel do in Babylon? What does a Daniel do under a, a leader who is Nebuchadnezzar? You don't organize a political revolt or a revolution to overthrow Babylonian empires. You become the best governor in Babylon. You earn their respect and show them the light. And even a Nebuchadnezzar bows to Yahweh. While it is true that God is in charge of our universe, God still invites His people to participate and collaborate with Him in the accomplishment of His plans, the advancement of His kingdom, and the redemption of nations. So, God in His wisdom allows us human beings to make choices as to which form of government would work best for our society. In our case, it's a democracy. During the time of the Bible times, Jesus and the apostles, and even the prophets, there's no democracy. It's monarchy. It's imperialism. So, their forms of government are different. They cannot choose their leaders. The, leader, the leaders 
were chosen for them. <laughs> Either through a family dynasty or through a powerful conquering of a nation. In our, ter- in our times today, at least in the Philippines, we are a republic. We are not a monarchy. We are a democracy. We choose our leaders. Our constitution allows for that to vote. The majority wins. The people speaks. The leader is installed. But the point is, no matter what political system we have, whether it's a monarchy or a democracy, whether it's an empire or a republic, the hand of God controls the affairs of our nations. That is why 1 Timothy chapter 2 says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions and prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings. Remember, the ancient times, just no democracy. You just pray for your leaders and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. You remember the instruction of God to those who are exiled in Babylon? It's not destroy all the idols of Babylon. Burn all their corrupt and false teachings. That's not the instruction of God to the exiles. The instruction of God to the exiles through the prophet Jeremiah was this. Pray for the prosperity of the city. Marry and have children. Do business. Help them. Prosper the city. For when the city prospers, you prosper as well. I believe we are in the times of Daniel. I believe we live in Babylon. This is not a Christian world anymore. This is not the Christian majority society anymore. The values of same-sex marriage, the values of divorce and abortion, and the values of secularism predominates. We are not the majority. We are the minority. Therefore, we are the Daniels in Babylon. We can be light in the darkest times. So this encouragement by the Apostle Paul of praying for those in authority can definitely be easier said than done, especially when you don't like your political leaders. Ano? How do you pray? You pray that they die? <laughs> but he challenged them something very, very difficult, but honors God. There are many things that you know, Jesus' challenge or instructs us to do that are difficult, but we do it because it honors God. We also need to vote prayerfully, responsibly, and wisely. When you, when you vote, you don't just vote thinking about what you want. You vote thinking about what is good for the many, what is good for the majority. That's democracy. You know? it's not, democracy is not just whatever the majority likes. Democracy is also what's good for the majority, not for the few. So choosing the best candidate is one way of showing love for others. Ah! For me, that's very insightful. You know, I can argue until I am blue that this candidate is the best for me. (laughs) But the question is, is it the best for many? And so that's something I need to wrestle with. By the way, my wife is voting for one candidate. I am voting for another. And so, and that's very interesting. No, we don't have to fight. We don't have to argue. We just have to say, okay, okay, I see your point. I hear you. Okay. <laughs> so we pray, we discern, and we vote wisely. And in the spirit of democracy, as Christians living in a democracy, not in an empire, we live in a republic. The beauty of diverse votes is what makes democracy work. And so don't bash or cancel people simply because you don't like who they, who they are voting for. And besides, as Christians, we can be confident, not panicky, that whoever wins after May 9, it's not just the will of the people, it's the will of God as well. That's a theology that is hard to swallow, but it's true. God's hand is behind all governments, whether you like it or not. Whether it's a Julius Caesar, a Pontius Pilate, or a Nebuchadnezzar, or a Nero, Remember, Proverbs 21 says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. God is in charge. Brothers and sisters, remember, the truth about governments, empires, and rulers is that they all come and go. They all rise and fall. 
Yet God remains in charge over our nation and over our world. Ah, our highest allegiance is to God, not to political entities or governing authorities. And so we have to check our hearts when we do political engagement and political conversations, whether online or face-to-face, with our friends, our family, our churchmates, our office mates, and our classmates. For me, I am now almost turning 50 in the next few months. Five decades of my existence, many, many governments, many, many presidents in my lifetime I have encountered. Good, bad, crazy, straight. You know, when I, when I was younger, I was like many of you. I was gigil, I was intense, I was, you know, I was willing to die for a political person and a political candidate, and I'm willing to, you know, leave my church or s- split my relationships or break my friendships. Because you're young, you're idealistic, you're, you're narrow-minded, <laughs> you are, you see yourself as right and the rest of the world is wrong. But as you grow, as you mature, as you, as you encounter the imperfections of our governments and of our world, and as you receive, the, you, know, you become a recipient of uh, the generous, generous grace of God, you become a bearer of grace as well. And now my, you know, my journal is filled with, Lord, I'd rather have more friends than more enemies. Gone are the days when you would just argue a point and destroy friendships. Today, the bottom line is win people at any cost for the gospel. Build friendships, build bridges, and not burn them, especially for minute things like politics. So after May 9, our church is you know, trying to, okay, May 9 elections is over. Restore your friendships. Go back to church na. Don't leave your family. Don't hate your mom because she voted differently. Don't hate your pastor because he was too quiet to endorse your preference in politics. Because May 9 is not the point. The point is the glory of God, the advancement of the kingdom, the growth of the church, and the love we share as fellow believers. So as followers of Jesus living in a democracy, remember this. We belong to a higher kingdom. God's rule is above and beyond any political government. We are spiritually united in Christ, but our political views as believers are diverse. (laughs) We are the light of the world. Our thoughts, speech, and actions must reflect who Christ is. And we trust that God is in charge of history. Pray with discernment and vote with wisdom. Some of us have much repenting to do. That's okay. I've been there. I know. I understand. You can be very, very emotionally invested and you become Taliban-like and absolutists in whatever political convictions you have. But we can change. We can humble ourselves and say, God, it's not worth it. It's not worth destroying the church. It's not worth destroying my marriage. It's not worth destroying my family over this. It's not worth losing my friends over this. The world is more beautiful than this. <laughs> the kingdom of God, the gospel is more beautiful than May 9 elections. Whoever wins, tandaan niyo po ito, sino man ang manalo, ang Diyos ang nakakaalam, di natin alam, di natin maintindihan. There are many things in life we cannot understand and explain. God knows better than us. Amen? His ways are higher. Be a Daniel in Babylon, even if the leader is Nebuchadnezzar. Don't panic. It's not the end of the world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. You call us to be light of the world. You call us to be gracious, to be a salt in our conversation, to, get, to, to put salt in our conversations, to make it flavorful and meaningful so that we represent Jesus to our conversations, to our relationships, to our dialogue and our engagements in the world. Lord, have mercy on us. Pagpalain mo po ang bansang Pilipinas, anuman pong mangyari sa aming eleksyon. Lord, we pray for an honest, clean, and efficient elections on May 9. Lord, wala na pong kaguluhan mangyari. Wala na pong mga pandarayang mangyari. Maawa ka sa aming bansa, sa aming ekonomiya, 
As we rise from this pandemic, I pray that the elections, Lord, will not even add to all the turmoil and all the damage that pandemic did to our country. I pray that as Christians, we will lead the way to kind and respectful disagreeing. That we can disagree and still be loving and be respectful and be kind to our fellow Filipinos and our fellow believers. We love you, we honor you, we praise you today in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Maraming salamat po. Magandang umaga. Thank you for that uh, wonderful message. As you have noticed in this church, we do not endorse any candidate, but we have to teach every member of Christ what does the Bible teach? What does the Bible say? So it's very important that uh, we understand as Christians, we are the salt and light wherever we go. Even in times of politics. And yes, we have to vote wisely. We have to choose wisely and choose as much as possible the candidate that God wants us to choose. But again, let us remember. Let us do it with love with each other. No? And so I praise God for that message, just like the message last week also, reminding us to vote wisely, but also remembering that during this time of election, we continue to shine for Jesus. Continue to shine for Jesus. Okay? So I'd like us now to prepare our hearts and minds as we come to the Lord in Holy Communion. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Remember, as we partake of this, we are actually proclaiming the Lord's death. We're actually saying to ourselves, Lord, Thank you for what you did on the cross for me. But we're also proclaiming it to those around us and to those who may not know him yet. So whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. And we mentioned this during our What on Earth is God Doing? In verse 30 it says, That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some even have died. Let us take this Holy Communion seriously. But not only during Holy Communion, every day of our life. Let us make sure that we are walking with God. We are making sure we need to make sure that we continue to honor God the way we live our lives, and especially as we partake. So I'd like us now to just close our eyes, bow down our heads, and come before God. Ask the Lord, Lord, search my heart. Lord, are there sins in my life? Are there things that I have done, Lord, to be not honoring to you, to you during this time of election? Have I said words that may have given a bad light about you? Help me, Lord, to be always reflect Christ in my words, in my actions. So let us take a moment right now to confess our sins before God silently as we let the Holy Spirit search our hearts.
Yes, Father, give us a pure heart, Lord. A pure heart, Father, because that's what you long for. And may not be the longing of our hearts to, as we partake of this Holy Communion. We are reminded of your promise, Father, in your word that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just, and you will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Father. Make us worthy to partake, Lord, of this Holy Communion. In Jesus' name, Amen. May I ask, please, the communion ushers to come forward. Remember all you've done for us. We remember your covenant with us. We remember and worship you, O Lord. As we drink this cup, we worship you. As we eat this bread, we honor you. And we offer you our yes, lives Father. as you have offered yours for us. Yes, we remember all you've done for us. We remember your covenant with us. We remember and worship you, O Lord. We remember all you've done for us. We remember your sacrifice for us. We remember and worship you, O Lord. May I ask everyone to please stand. And as you are holding the bread, I'd like you to just close your eyes and remember what Christ did on the cross. Remember this symbolizes the body of Christ broken for you and me that we may experience true life eternal life the forgiveness of our sins and when Jesus had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me. Let us all partake. As you hold on to the cup, I'd like you to remember the blood of Jesus Christ that shed from his head because of wearing the crown of thorns. And also because of the nail that pierced his hand. And on his side, as he was pierced with a spear, blood gushed out. Let us remember that Jesus Christ shed his blood for you and for me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us partake. Our gracious, merciful, loving God, we don't deserve what your son did on the cross for us. We don't deserve that you sent him for us. We are all sinners. And yet while we were yet sinners, 
Christ died on the cross for us. Thank you. Thank you that your love is indeed unconditional. Thank you that you love us eternally and that will never change. Father, help us, Lord, because of that love you have given us that we may also speak of love to others and let them also experience the love that they could have through Christ. Help us to live a life worthy of what Christ did for us. And may we continue to honor you in our words and our actions every day of our life. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for giving us now the strength and the victory, and now we could live a truly victorious life. Thank you. We give you thanks. We give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. You may all be seated. In just a moment, we are going to continue our worship by giving back to God some of what He has given to us. May I call on the ashes? The sun cannot compare to the glory of your love. There is no shadow in your presence. No more the man will dare to stand before your throne, before the Holy One of Heaven. It's only by your blood and it's only through your mercy lord i come i bring an offering of worship to my king no one on earth deserves the praises that i sing jesus may you receive the honor that you're due Oh Lord, I bring an offering to you. I bring an offering of worship to my King. No one on earth deserves the praises that I sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. Oh Lord, I bring an offering to you. Oh Lord, I bring an offering to you. To receive the benediction. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. To him be the glory now and forevermore. Amen. Amen, Amen, Amen. We may be seated. For our announcement, we are cordially inviting all our children ages 5 to 13 for our Sunday School's annual summer activity. This time, we have DVBS entitled, All We Need Is Love. Wow. It is a four-day event packed with fun and activities. And of course, the most important part is the lessons we prepared about our God and the stories that will help all of us follow God. This is an online event, so we can invite more children to join and get to know who God is. Please register with us as soon as you can through the link provided or you can privately message us in Facebook page or in our messenger.
Another important announcement is that our English worship service will change its schedule from 9 a.m. to 10.30. But this will start on May 15, so it's next, next week. Again, it's May 15, 2022. We are going to have our English worship service at 10.30 in the morning. For the rest of the announcements, let us watch this video. <laughs> 